Thank you all for being here. So we don't often do the short film and feature film Q&As together, but it seemed like we had to for, for these two films. They really go together. And actually encourage all of you to ask each other questions, too, because I'm sure as filmmakers you have some questions. Too. Um, but I'll kick, kick things off. Um, so Mother's Day, how did you hear about this program? Well, it really came out of an idea. Uh, Elizabeth and I went to the same uh, school together. And um, I was kind of on a, a trajectory of doing prison films, and she was on a trajectory of doing bus films. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we kind of played around with this idea. Like, I, she she actually heard about the program and then chucked it my way and see if saw if I wanted to try to go for it. And um, yeah, so the Get on the Bus program is a project out of the Center for Restorative Justice Works. And uh, they've been uh, really instrumental in, in really guiding us through the different stories and experiences. How did you settle on this kind of three-part structure of the oh. bus, the prison, and the and Yo, the that was mad difficult because um, we, Elizabeth and I, had gone for maybe two and a half months, like maybe every weekend for the most part, just riding with different families all over California. So we're talking from Sacramento to San Diego or Burbank to Folsom, you know, and, and these were like really almost 24 hour kind of excursions. Um, so we've, we filmed mothers, but also fathers. Um, but when it came down to it, uh, we were trying to figure out what, what, I mean, it was a tough decision, but we, we thought that seeing kids and mothers was a little more affecting to see and witness and, and be a part of. Uh, with regards to the young man, uh, Judah, also known as Hezekiah, um, that was a solo shoot, and it was our last shoot, and um, he was like maybe one of three kids on that particular leg of the trip, and I'm not kidding you, but we were talking from 2 a.m. till 9 a.m. Ten, this 10-year-old 10 kid was just precocious and a really old soul, and uh, his grandparents were, and great-grandparents who are raising him, um, kindly let me kind of in their homes to kind of wrap it all up and unify it. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And then Kiara, um, I'm curious, how, what, what, what was the concept first? Was it about Hawaiians in Arizona, which is in itself kind of a fascinating topic, or was it about the characters? First? What, like, what, what made you want to embark on this journey? I think when we started the film, uh, we were going to make a short film, and obviously it got much longer. Um, and, uh, you know, what connected us to it was, uh, it didn't make sense to me. You know, when I first learned about the story, it was, oh, are, are people dancing hula in a prison in Arizona? And why? Why? And so, uh, Chapin and I went up the first time and, um, we left the prison feeling like, this is really fucked up. Sorry. Um, and afterwards, uh, we went for ice cream, because that's what I do. I uh, eat my feelings. And yeah, and we just, we just went up again and again to sort of follow the cultural practice. And you know, it, it, in, my, in my opinion, it's not enough to show that you know, we have this cultural transformation in this very like, antiseptic setting. I think in order to really give people an understanding of what it means to to find this and what the challenges are, um, we made the decision to follow them on the outside as well, so that you know we have a uh, a very clear understanding. I think it's uh, common to see these programs where we see transformation in the prison setting, but you know what are the complications outside of that that actually like affect whether or not you can be successful when you reintegrate? Oh, uh, I wanted to add to that too that. You know, in many ways, we couldn't have started with characters because we didn't know who they were and we were outside of the prison coming in. And these guys found us, like very found us. She can talk to that better than I can. But these guys found us and um, we worked very hard to make it their story. But it was also a discovery process of trying to figure out what their story and their point of view is, which um, I think as people who weren't familiar with the system that they're living in, it's like, took us time to even kind of like wrap our brains around what they were doing and why they were doing things and the forces that affect their decision making um, for better and worse. So Kiara, you want to talk about how they found you? 
Uh, I'd never been in a prison before the first time we went in to shoot. We thought it would take us a year to get access to the prison. It took us 10 days. I called Shape and I said, we have no money. You want to go to prison? And he, and he said, OK. And I said, all right. And so you know, we, we obviously cleared the background checks. And we showed up. Uh, and it was such an effort just to show up um, that we really hadn't, I hadn't even had time to kind of process what was going to happen. And um, I mean, I'll, this is a slight aside, but when we walked into the prison after taking like an hour and a half just to check in, there was 100 men in this rec yard, and they all chanted us into this space. And I had no idea what, it, what to expect. You know, everyone's like, oh, you have, you, know, you have to be cautious and you have to be safe about your, you know, your privacy. And all I could do was cry. Because it wasn't what, what I expected. And like, for me personally, it was a lot of like, you know, unpacking what your perspective is on prison, because I'd never been to one prior. Oh, and then, I, then after this, I'm like totally emotional. My brain's mush. And this bald-headed guy with a tattoo on his face walks up to me and he goes, I gotta find you when I get out. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. <laughs> and what he meant to say, what he meant was, I'm gonna find you when I get out because I want you to know I'm gonna make it. And so when I understood that, I was like, okay, if this is what you wanna do, I'm gonna listen. Um, and with our second character, Holly, um, it was just, we bumped into him on, on, on the outside. And then we reverse engineered the introduction on him in the film. He was there, and we kind of had thought about, like, oh, okay, we'll get this, like, handing, you know, the, the torch to the next guy as David leaves. Oh, uh, sorry. You know, we had, we had been filming him a little bit, but not as a character. It was like, oh, David will pass the torch as he leaves the prison to this guy who we had barely met. And so we did have some footage, but it was, like, you know, every frame we of him. Everything. Yeah, like, everything we have of him in prison is in this movie because of that, because we didn't know he would be a character. So, so RJ, I'd actually love to hear from your perspective. I mean, you've, this is your second film that you've done in a prison, or mm. as, as far as I mean, maybe you've done more. Um, more. So, so two, so two questions. One is, how does your uh, experience in a prison compare with theirs? But also, their film is very character oriented, whereas yeah. I think feel like yours is more about the institution and right. about. And right. so, so, why, why, so the second question is, why didn't you go t deeper into characters? Great questions. Um, I think uh, I just want to echo what Kiara was saying about being in prison. Um, I, I feel like every time I've, I've been on the grounds and interacted with folks inside and outside, you always end up asking why. You know, why does this system exist? Um, I just wanted to make that comment, first of all. Because, uh, like, no project actually kind of justifies. I, the more you peel back the skin, you realize it just doesn't make sense. Um, so the question was, uh, why, why did we not go deeper into characters? Um, I think for uh, Elizabeth and I, we're, we're trying to reconcile, like trying to illustrate a system uh, and try to strike the balance of, of manifesting and surfacing how institutions kind of mark themselves on people through their gestures, through the types of conversations they have. Um, I did a previous film on a long distance running group inside of San Quentin State Prison, and it was very much about trying to understand space and geographies um, within, uh, and so it was more about being immersed in that and trying to bring you as close as possible. Um, but I do respect like the character driven form because it is, you know, that's, there, there are a lot more emotional valences that surface that you can kind of appreciate. Um, I think also because we were kind of bound to the short form. <laughs> so you can't really go too deep into a character, but um, I'd love to pursue like a feature form of some kind uh, to do a degree of justice as, as you all have done with these. Well, I cried when I saw your film. Oh, so, yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think that's why you, I think both your films are really complimentary that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we both ride the bus. Yeah, we both <laughs> rode the bus. Um, so I, I, I'm sure when you saw the hula in this uh, prison, it must have been moving. Or uh, what, was, what was your initial reaction to that? Um, I really connected with that. I, and I, this is just me in general. I connect with things that are really raw and feel honest to me. And um, there's something I understood about that. You know, we, thought, we talk about like what's authentic in terms of a storyteller. And it's like, yeah, I could say I'm Hawaiian too, but you know, is that enough? 
And for me, I was like, you know, I can understand the struggle of coming back from like really tough things. And that's what I saw in the performance, like this need, this like deep and raw need to excavate what's inside you and really just, you know, process it. And um, I saw how they, you know, when I saw how they, how they felt on that, you know, in the rec yard, it was, you know, it was something I understood. So, you know, for me, it was just like, I saw myself in there in some ways. And so, yeah, I needed, it felt compelled to shoot it. And obviously, Chapin does a gorgeous job, so. I think one of the things, I mean, we both came out of there being like, what did we just see? Right, like the first time you just like, whoa. But it didn't become normal. I mean, over a couple of years of commuting up there, a couple times a year to, to go to these things. We were largely at these large events, but you don't see that at home. We're not seeing, it, it, like you might see those actions or those chants, but the level of emotional investment and kind of, um, there is no, I mean, they're, they're not a performance. There's not an audience. These guys are in a rec yard in the middle of nowhere doing this in a prison at four o'clock in the morning or in the middle of the sun and there's nobody else around. It's very odd and powerful to see them do this with that much passion because mostly where these kind of things are taking place is like on a stage at Mary Monarch or uh, on a luau stage or in a touristic space or something else. So I, I mean, Kiara could probably talk to that more, but I, I feel like that was one of the things that was very shocking to me is that like you just don't see that level of something for no other reason than it's your own identity and spirituality. Um, I'd love to open up for the to the audience for questions. Anybody have a question? So, how were the guys now from the out of state movie, like David, Halle, Kalani, and them? Do you, do you guys like keep in touch? Yeah, I saw them last weekend. Um, Chapin and I have spent every Thanksgiving with Halle since he got out. So his wife makes a mean turkey, <laughs> and um, uh, I can say that Kalani's story hasn't changed which I think fits in line with expectation. Um, I think the hardest part is uh, what we've seen with David. And um, I go back and forth on this every day. Like, you know, what's the best thing for him? Um, I, I can't say, and I don't know what you want to say. You know, when I talked to him four months ago, he said the struggle is real. He hadn't gotten back to me for about a year. I finally saw him a week and a half ago for the first time in over a year, and he looks terrible. So I wish I had better news, but I think it's the truth, and I think that's part of why we're here. I, I was just going to say, I think both of them, even as bad as, as I think David is doing in his current state, I, I think both of them hope that this is a platform for change for their community. Um, and I do think that they're representative of like thousands of men who are going through similar similar things in our state and around this country and probably around the world. Um, we've seen how this is connected with audiences in other spaces and how this story is not just true for Pacific Islanders or Native Hawaiians or anybody but a, a lot of other people. So I do think that they're both hoping for that. Um, whether David will be able to do that or not is a whole other story. Can, oh. Sorry, just to quickly add on to that, like why would anyone let us follow them, right? Like we're in really intimate spaces with them. And the reason why you know these men gave us access is because they were hopeful that this would show to other people and we create some form of understanding. So they made themselves put themselves in a very vulnerable space for you. Um, and you know we just want to thank them f for doing that. Um, it's not easy. Yeah, the first person who was released from prison, who was on parole, the first one on parole, is he still married with his wife, or what's he doing today and all that? Oh, it's storybook ending, bro. So still good. Yeah, we're all good. <laughs> you you see him, you hug him, a high five. Everybody's happy. Good. Yeah, I mean, he, he had to get to that point, right? To get to the happy ending, it was like it was the true journey, right? He he did some terrible things, and you know he still has a lot to come back from, but he's still he's still on the outside, and he's still trying. So I I feel I feel solid about where he's at, and I'm proud of him. Do you want to speak to any? Do you want to elaborate on that at all um, about? Uh, having the Native Hawaiian crew and was that intentional or what? Um, it, was, it was pretty easy to find a Native Hawaiian crew to make a, this documentary. 
Um, well, our producer on the film is my cousin. We went to Kamehameha class of 1998 together. So, um, you know, I think it just started with us. Um, and then obviously, like, Chapin's a very good friend. And, you know, uh, Claire I met later. I um, We almost worked with her brother. I would say, like, you know, we've been fortunate to have members of our community support the project. But we also had this mindset that it wasn't just about creating the project with an only internal focus, although the inside outside of the authenticity of it is important. Um, we wanted to make sure we partnered with people outside of our community so that people outside of our community would understand, right? Because it's hard for me to translate the kind because you, you just either get it or you don't, right? So for us in post production, you don't know what the kind is. So it's like I had, I ha we, we made conscious decisions to partner with people also outside of our community so we could make sure that the film made sense to not just me and my cousin and all of the Hawaiians so that it would make sense to people outside so that you know the conversations would be bigger and more relevant too. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, right here. Uh, what are the plans for uh, like a further release? I mean, where, where else is this film going to be shown? Um, we will be showing at a bunch of uh, additional film festivals as well, um, outofstatefilm.com. Um, and we will be showing on uh, PBS's Independent Lens in the fall of 2018. So we're really proud to be able to say that um, you know, this was our goal from the start, to have uh, free and broad access to the film, um, to continue the conversation. And then we're working on um, having legislative screenings as well. And anyone can see Mother's Day. Yeah, I was just going to say. You want to tell yeah, everyone pitch how to watch it? because I'm a fan. <laughs> uh, you can find Mother's Day on Opdocs, New York Times Opdocs. It was out in season six, I believe. Other questions? Yeah, right here. So, so the question um, is, has David seen the film? So David first got back to me when he saw the trailer online because I've been going through homeless camps throughout the island handing out my phone number to everybody so he would get back to me and he wouldn't call me back. And I knew why. Um, he saw the trailer for the first time and he called me in tears. And I said, okay, when well, can we meet? I want to show you the film. And, you know, he couldn't get it together to meet with me. Um, and then finally when he saw that the film was coming out, I was like, you have to be there. I was called, you know, you have to be there. And he came and he cried. So he's seen the film twice now and he, his entire family has come out to see it as well. Um, and it, uh, it means a lot to him. I'm just curious to get an understanding of how the support has, f has failed David, like, and not not family. I'm talking about like, halfway houses and uh, nonprofits. I mean, does Hawaii have any kind of infrastructure that helps men uh, rehabilitate um, and restore like substance? I mean, because he had the cards stacked against him, you know, uh, paying child support. I imagine restitution, legal fees. Like that shit just just compounds and like, it's it's system wide. It's not just Hawaii, but I'm just curious to know if if that's an element. Um, yeah, we have a very limited transitional uh, infrastructure for men and for women, and so you know that's part of the shortcoming. I think also uh, when you come out of prison, you're used to being in a setting where people tell you what to do and you better do it. Right, And so when you get out of that setting and you're already in this mindset, you've been thinking this way for 20 years, you know, you don't know to challenge or question or ask questions of things. So like, it doesn't matter what is accurate, it's about their perspective and the uh, lack of understanding. Like, I can't tell you how many men that we've met think they can't vote. Like Chip and I talk about this all the time, even though they can with a lot of limitations or, you know, that doesn't seem reasonable with the child support, but that's his understanding of it. Right. So, you know, it's it's a little bit of both. It's like, um, you know, there are support systems, but understanding how to connect un understanding how to feel comfortable, understanding you can ask questions and challenge is not necessarily something that you're in the mindset to do when you've you know, you have to ask if you can go to the bathroom for 15 years. I think one of the things you don't see in the film is like when David moves to working at Ho'omaukeola, they, you know, so one of the guys staff working there would say, okay, everybody line up to the people who are in the program to be, you know, help made sober. And David would go get in the line, right? Not on the staff side, but on, on the, the client side. And, you know, they're not prisoners, they're, in, they're clients. But, you know, it was just, 
he was so institutionalized at that point that that's something that it was hard to to put that in the film it didn't quite work but he was in that mindset in many many ways in his life and the staff would have to be like no Kavika come over here you're you're on this side so um yeah he was heavily institutionalized in many ways beyond what you see here um maybe a a any last questions yes go ahead the question is how as filmmakers do you feel like do you feel do you feel pressured to, to get involved in the subject's lives um i mean that's how I understand this world is just through the camera and to say that I'm able to separate myself as a documentarian as a profession like in this very cold way is just doesn't register with me this is like a this is like an eternal conversation uh in document and not in the non-fiction form because you you fuck with ethics and and all of that jazz and and storytelling because of it but you can't help but be human I mean that's just the bottom line and so, uh, yeah, we keep in touch, we stay friends, we try to help as much as we can, um, but you know, you know, we're documentary filmmakers, we ain't got a lot of money, <laughs> so. <laughs> but what we, do ha what we don't have in money, we make, for, make up for in listening, and, and I think that's like one of the more found foundational things uh, that we can do. I think that's really accurate. I mean, our, our guys at the Q&A in, at home we're saying like oh you know i'm i'm glad people are seeing this right like it's they wanted people to see how hard it is david says that in the film but that day was really hard for us for me especially i think because i'm literally standing right in front of a man who's not doing well and i think for her and in, in in a very different way um i have a little bit of the barrier of the camera but it's still very much right in front of me you know i'd say though that he called us that day and it was important to him that we see that and that we show you that. That last scene, that la that last scene where we see him homeless on the beach, that was his decision. I would have never asked for that. He called me and he said, you need to come find me. And his phone died. And Chapin and I showed up at 8 a.m. the next day and scoured the beaches in Nanakuli to find him. We looked like a messed up church group. Like, why are you? I'm like, I'm not his PO. He's my friend. I'm like, and I, you know, we went out to find him. Was I expecting that? No. And when we first saw him, it was like incredibly upsetting. We had to go, like we just left. And we had to go and like we downloaded our cards and we were like, well, I don't know what to do. Because I also didn't know what state he was in, right? And I was like, pack all your stuff up, anything you don't need, leave your wallets. Just to be honest, because I didn't know where he was at. He's, he's back on drugs, right? Um, and it was really hard, you know, and it still is hard. And I think this is, in my mind, this is the best way that I can help. I can, you know, what he wanted to do is show people what it was like on, on, on the outside. And so we're giving that platform to him and that was really meaningful. Um, I can't say I can fix his life for him. I'm functional, I could do that, but that's not the real solution. I'm not the real solution. The real solution is all of you. The real solution is changing our mindset about all of this. It's understanding that we all mess up and sometimes we do terrible, terrible, terrible things. But what do we really believe? After you spend your 20 years in prison, are you afforded the opportunity to start over again? You know, and that's a risk we all take. That's a risk we all take. So, you know, it's just a consideration, like, what do you believe in? And I had to challenge myself with that. So do I believe that David can come back from where he's at? I absolutely hope so, and I believe it, but it's on him as well. And it's on our community as well to change. Like, the ownership is on all of us. Thank you. Um, on that note, thank you, RJ. Thank you, Kiara. Thank you, Chapin. Thank you for being listeners and for letting us all listen in as well. Um, and thank you all for being here.